types of traction, how we apply traction, the complications, and then a few little specifics at the end. Now, traction as a treatment, as a first aid treatment, has been going on for time immemorial. And I think if you think about it, if you've ever seen it or been at the scene of an accident where a child or somebody has developed a bent limb or a dislocated joint, it's almost an instinct to get hold of it and to try and straighten it. And when you think about what we're doing, we are pulling on it. It's traction. And there are very good reasons why we do that. This is a lovely picture uh, from... Um, some ancient English book of, I don't know whether it's torture or traction, but I think they were trying to relocate a dislocated shoulder. So first of all, you need to think about where, why we, we do anything to fractures. So when we, when we, divert, when we have a, an undisplaced fracture, and I hope I've convinced you that this is a spiral fracture in the, in the tibia of a child, we don't really need to do anything much, do we? It's going to heal up. It's a stable fracture, and all we need to do is keep the fracture still long enough that the pain goes away, the fracture heals, and the child can walk again. So we don't really need to do anything as practitioners with that fracture other than treating it in a plaster. But then there are other fractures which are extremely painful, very displaced, and so we need to intervene. So on the left, this patient was involved in a high-speed road traffic accident, and that fracture was actually segmental. So that's very displaced, and the patient did a lot of pain. But of course, on the right, an intertrochanteric fracture in an elderly patient who also has an awful lot of pain and is unable to get up. So what do we do? We intervene. The, the options are we, we need to reduce it, so we can either do that closed, so without doing an operation, or we do it open with operation. So this is a typical manipulation of uh, a wrist fracture, for example. So here's our, here's our hip fracture on the traction table, so traction is being applied, post between the legs, foot feet strapped to the, the table, the leg being pulled, and you can see that our fracture has been beautifully reduced. Jensen's lines have been recreated, so that's very, you can still see the fracture line, but that's very nicely reduced. So we could just leave the patient there for six weeks on traction, but of course that's totally impractical. So we either need to do an operation to fix it there, or think of ways of holding that sort of position on traction where you can still nurse the patient and exist as a human being. So in theatre, what we tend to do is fix it with metal work. And so in this case, the patient had a dynamic hip screw, which holds the, the, uh, the fracture still while it heals up, and even allows the patient to walk the next day, which is a miracle of modern science. So what is traction? So I looked up the definition of traction, medical traction. It's application of a longitudinal force to a body part. So we use it to reduce fractures and dislocations. We use it to hold the fracture or the dislocation reduced. And it utilizes the soft tissues around the fracture to reduce the fracture. So on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see the broken bone, and then all around it, the soft tissues are filling up with blood. So there's periosteum, there's muscle, tendon, and ligament, all suddenly loose. The nerves are loose, the, the veins and the arteries are loose, and can fill up the over. And so when you pull on it, those soft tissues become tight, and they mould the fracture back into the right position. Now I've made the most fabulous video there. So here we go. This is a fracture. The two bits of wood are the broken bone, and the, the elastic bands around the outside are the periosteum and the uh, soft tissues. And when it's broken, it's very painful. It can move about nothing, it's holding it rigid. But if you put traction on, the fracture reduces, and, the, and it actually moves as one. When you've got the traction on, the, the, uh, the bits of wood move as one because of the, 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 uh, the tension in the soft tissues around it. And so that's exceptionally good at reducing blood loss. It's very good at releasing pain, so once you get over the initial muscle spasm of actually pulling on the fracture, it's very much, it's extremely good at reducing pain and stopping nerve injuries and so on. Would you like to look at my model? It took me hours to make. <laughs> so if you apply traction, don't forget Newton's third law. You always have to have counter-traction. So in the case of a shoulder dislocation, you can pull on the arm to try and reduce it, but you'll pull the patient straight off the bed. So you either you need to think of another way of uh, stopping the patient moving. So you need counter traction. So in this case, there's a big bandage holding the patient there. With the Hippocratic method, you will know the Hippocratic method of reducing a shoulder dislocation. If you're on your own in the ED and you've got a patient that's well injured, you stick your foot in their armpit. If you do it with a bare foot, you can actually feel the humeral head with your toes. 
and you can feel it clunk back in if you just apply gentle traction of increasing force. Now this traction doesn't actually need to be a, a physical thing. If you're using gravity to reduce the dislocation, then the, the table itself acts as the, acts as the counter traction. So this is another method of reducing your shoulder dislocation. Lie the patient on their front, fill them up with something appropriate, probably ketamine or a lot of painkillers, and hang weights from their arm, and the shoulder can sometimes uh, reduce. Certainly not my favorite method, but if you're desperate, <coughs> it's worth a try. So one of the, one of the, one of the earliest interventions of, uh, or medical interventions in trauma where something was made is a Thomas Splint. So the Thomas Splint is named after Hugh Owen Thomas, who was um, an English um, orthopedic surgeon, but the father of a bone setter, who during, during war, between, yeah, before the First World War, realized if you splinted a compound femoral fracture, of which there were hundreds, thousands, millions probably, thousands, in the war, you saved the patient's life. So a Thomas splint is basically a bent piece of steel with a beautiful padded leather ring around the top which sits in the groin and it rests on the ischial tuberosity and on the symphysis pubis to provide the counteraction. The leg goes inside the splint, there's a halter that goes around the ankle uh, which you then tie to the end of the thing. You put a stick between it and you can crank on the traction. You can do that in the field to a soldier who's just been shot in the leg with all their clothes on and then you've got a patient who is comfortable because we've reduced the fracture. He doesn't move anymore. He's not losing blood, he's comfortable, um, and, the, and, and he's got a, a, a stiff limb. So you can actually carry him out of the battlefield. So the Thomas splint is still used very much today. The modern version is called the Kendrick splint, and every ambulance and every A&E department and every uh, first aid station has one of these. It comes in a bag, and it's essentially an aluminium tube which comes together as pieces, so it fits into a little bag, aluminium tube here, a strap that goes around the groin, so not as good at resting on the, on the bony prominences, so you can't keep it on for long, and then some straps around, and then down here you have a halter around the foot that goes onto the thing, and you've actually got a pneumatic pump, so you can pump the traction on and take the patient off the football field or, or out away from the um, road traffic accident scene or wherever it happens to be. And so we have lots of these in the UK, and I suspect you have them here too. Do you? No? No, well, I, think they, I don't think they're expensive. Well, they don't need to be expensive. So what are the benefits of traction? Well, once you've got the initial, got the initial traction on, pain relief. It restores bone alignment, and the, and the fracture starts to move as one. Um, and it restores blood flow in kinked arteries and kinked veins, and reduces blood loss. It allows wound management. Uh, for general nursing or for surgery, it rests in them in a functional position, and even can allow, if you set it up properly, and I'll show you some examples later, can allow joint movement during healing. It allows the patients to be moved. So the first traction that we put on when a patient comes to hospital is skin traction. And we think of skin traction is very simple and easy to apply, but done badly it can be disastrous, done well it can be very good. So it's really long place it. You don't put a limited weight on because, of course, most of our limbs are conical, and so you're pulling a cone off the cone, so it will slip. You need to be meticulous about the skin care because bad pressure effects can cause nerve causes, skin ulcers, compartment syndrome, deep vein thrombosis. The list is endless. So this is one of the, the, the hacks that we have in the UK. The leg is cleaned. This one is sticky, so you actually stick the, the strap to the leg and then you bandage it on tightly, but not too tightly. Paying particular attention to the bony prominences. So the bony prominences that we worry about in the lower limb are the malleoli of the ankle and the, uh, the fibular head, where an important nerve goes around. And if you do it too tight here, you can end up with a common perineal nerve palsy. There are all sorts of rules about how you bandage it. If you do cross bandages, you can get far more compression than you can if you just do round and round. So I was uh, reading the Royal College of Nursing, in fact I was reading the AO website where it tells you on the, on the, um, the traction page that you should do round and round managing rather than crisscross overlap to reduce the risk of that. So because I didn't really know the, the basic principles, I started to look around the internet. It, it turns out that our, the Royal College of Nursing in the UK on their website have an enormous document about the principles of traction. Um, but I picked out just the same features. It's very easy to look at, but I picked out the same features. 
So when you get the first patient, you need to make sure they're aware of what you're doing. Send the patient. The patient should have a pressure sore risk assessment done. So I think in, our, in the UK it's called a brain score, but you should assess the general pressure sores, and you should also think about where the skin traction is going to go to make sure that there are no particular risks of ulcers. Make sure the limb's got a pulse and there's no neurological injuries uh, already because you will feel very silly if you do it and then notice they've got a foot drop because you'll immediately blame the traction where they might have had it before. When you first put the traction on and you're overcoming that muscle spasm and the fracture ends are moving and the hematoma is being compressed <coughs> and the nerves are being moved, it's extremely painful. And so at that point you need to have some sort of analgesia available. Think about the DPT and PE risk of that patient um, and then get on with applying the traction. On a day-to-day -day basis, I was quite surprised by this, because this definitely doesn't happen in our hospital. So our College of Nurses suggests that the skin traction should be taken down and reapplied every single day. Now, it doesn't happen in the UK, I can assure you, and I don't suppose it happens here, because it would be very expensive if kids and so on, but that's what they recommend. You should check the pressure areas and report the findings, feel the pulse, make sure there's no neurological injury, check the traction apparatus is working, Encourage the patient to move the joint, sit up, do some breathing exercises, eat and drink, all the basic things. And that doesn't need to be the doctors or the nursing staff. We can all do a little bit of this when you walk past the end of the bed. It's very easy to encourage the patient to do these things. And it's very easy to make sure that the weights are not sitting on the floor or the patient slid down the bed. So this is an example. Of this, I mean, all of these slides are historical. So this is an example of a patient on something called a split bed. So he's had a femoral fracture treated only with traction, and he's towards the end of his treatment, and he's got the skeletal traction in, and they've taken away the end of his bed, so that even with his fractured femur, he can start practicing bending his knee. So almost as soon as the traction comes off, he can start to walk. But this sort of thing is ancient history. We don't ever see this in the UK. So, um, this is me and Martin on the war ground uh, a couple of days ago. So when you go around, check the traction. So I'm ashamed to say that both myself and Martin here, I was ashamed to say that we went to see our patient for a DHS. And I didn't want until I looked at the pack for the picture yesterday, but I realized that, look, the knot <coughs> is like the pump. So we've walked past the patient who's got traction on, but it's completely defective. But we should have, you know, it's not the nurse's responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility. We should have moved the patient up the bed so that the traction was working again. It's good, the traction's off the, uh, the weight's off the floor, but I would argue because the patient slipped down the bed, the line of pull isn't quite right. Make sure there are no knots, the pulleys are running freely, and the weights aren't on the floor. It's embarrassing when I'm down that slide, but we don't about it. So with regard to skin traction, it's usually a temporary measure, in, particularly in adults. You do it for three, four, five days, uh, and there are some situations where you can use skin traction for the whole treatment. So in little children under the age of two or three years old with femoral fractures, you do this thing called gallows traction, where skin traction is applied, and they're basically hung up by their legs. Bottoms off the bed. And I suspect the paediatric nurses do change this skin traction more, more frequently than they do on the adult ones because it will get soiled because of nappies and so on. So that's an example of a situation where traction can be, skin traction can be used as a definitive treatment. Very rare in adults. What typically happens in adults is we think we're about to do an operation, they're on skin traction, and it doesn't happen. So they, they then have four days of skin traction. Then the next day the surgeon's sick, and the next day it's cancelled again, and, and so the patient ends on, on skin traction for longer than we hope, but with regular changes it should be fine. So if the patient's <coughs> gonna be treated definitively with traction, we convert it to skeletal traction. So we put a pin through a bone that we can apply the traction to, because it's more solid, and we can hang bigger weights off it. It can be applied in the theatre or on the ward and under local or general anaesthetic. So occasionally um, in my training I'd be asked to put a, a pin through a tibial tubercle or a distal femur on the ward in an elderly patient with a hip fracture if they weren't going to the theatre for a time. And my experience was that they tolerated it very well. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. What I like to use, rather than the smooth Steinman pins, um, a surgeon in the UK invented this type of pin that's threaded. Have you heard of or seen denim pins? Do you have them? Yeah, okay. So you know about denim pins. They are by, by far and away the best because they don't allow the bone to slip. 
and I just took a video of. So this is a chap had an X-mix on with a smooth pin. He was in a lot of pain because his foot was sliding back and forth on the pin because it wasn't a denim pin. Um, it had also been in for a long time and it was probably in the wrong position. But it just highlights the point. Use a threaded pin if you can. Sure. So what do you need to apply tra um, to apply skeletal traction on the wall? If you need some local anaesthetic. Um, you need a stirrup, some swab, something to clean the skin, a knife, and the pin itself. When you're putting the local anaesthetic in, the two, the two really sensitive points are the skin, and then you've got to get onto the periosteum, because the pain in the bone comes from two places, the periosteum and the increase in pressure in the bone as you put something into it. So it needs to the skin, get right down onto the periosteum, and then the pain that they will get is just a bit of discomfort as you go through the bone because you're increasing the intraosseous pressure. Have anybody, any of you ever given intraosseous fluids to a trauma patient? In a child, drilled into it? They, 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 if they wake up while you're putting fluid into the bone, it's agonizingly painful, isn't it? Because of that increase in intraosseous pressure. So that's why they'll get pain, you can't do anything about it. But they shouldn't have any acute agonizing pain if you anesthetize the skin and you anesthetize the periosteum. Um, and then you've got to think about where best to do it. So, um, Lots of these slides are from the AO website, which actually got a really good, we've got a really good section on traction. So if you want to read a bit more about it, read that. So the tibia, is a tibial tube is a good choice uh, because there's good solid bone and you can stay well away from the capsule of the joints. You go approximately two centimeters behind the tibial tubercle and push it through. It can be quite hard. Another good area is the distal femur. So again, think about your anatomical knowledge of where the capsule of the knee joint is. If there's a huge superpatellar pouch up here, so if you go too far anterior, you can be intra-articular, uh, intra which will be disaster. You can give the patient septic arthritis. But if you come about two centimeters back, three centimeters back in the, in, in the uh, axis of the knee, at the level of the patella, you avoid the, um, the capsule of the joint. Um, and then you need to attach the stirrup. So when you've made a hole in the skin, just put something very simple over it, like a saline soaked gauze or a better bean soaked gauze, and somehow attach it so it doesn't fall off. Now the, you, the, I've got a picture of, one of what you do here, which is very neat, and I'd like to take it home if I can find any patients to do an old traction. You then put the stirrup on, make sure that it's all friction free and moving nicely, and attach your traction. You attach it to cord. So other good sites are a calcaneal pin. So this is the same guy that had his experts put on a long time ago somewhere up country. And unfortunately, they put it in, they put it in, in the wrong spot. So the correct spot uh, for, for oscalsis uh, uh, traction is about two centimeters up towards the ankle from the tip of the uh, oscalsis, just here. This actually had completely missed the bone, unfortunately, and was sliding about. And I'm amazed they managed to avoid the neurovascular bundle. It's just you know, <coughs> again, you just feel the heel, and put your fingers either side, two centimeters up from the tubercle, you're safe. The only thing you might get is the um, serial nerve, uh, but if you do it blunt uh, from the lateral side, you should be fine. So what are the advantages of traction? So the advantages are you avoid an operation, basically, with all of the risks that come with an operation. It avoids a big, big time a length of period in uh, plaster, and if you've got the setup, it facilitates the movement, early movement of the joint side side of the fracture, which is extremely important. Disadvantages, it requires a huge amount of time in hospital and in vet, and I think that's why it doesn't happen in the UK anymore, because the cost of being in hospital for a day in a bed is astronomically high, um, compared to when you consider that a patient might be in hospital for six or eight weeks. Whereas if they have an operation, the cost of the operation is expensive, but it pales into insignificance compared to a day in bed. Disadvantages, the amount of time you spend in bed. If you sit in, if you lie in bed for a long time, if you take an 80 or a 90 year old person, their muscle and their bone just disappears almost instantly and it's very difficult to get to go again. So you've got to really work on making them sit up and move their joints. Muscle wasting, bone wasting, thrombosis, and of course the cost. What are the complications? So the big complications you need to worry about are the skin, the most important one. So pin size infection, bed sores, pneumonia, stasis in bed, venous thromboembolism, joint stiffness, nerve injury from the pin size, 
and wasting. Now, this is one of our patients from this week, um, who is an unfortunate lady who was suffering from schizophrenia. And she had um, sticky string tra skin traction on for quite some time, and had some skin changes here, which I'm not sure whether they were um, ulcers from the traction, but they might have been, because she was quite acutely unwell psychiatrically, I think, when she came in. But that's the sort of thing you've got to look out for. And you can do every single day on the ward round, whether you're the senior doctor or the cleaner. We can all look at the patients and work out if they're getting the right sort of treatment. So what are the signs and symptoms of a, a pin size infection? Well, it's the old classic of infection. Rubral, calor, global. I didn't know the Latin for discharge. Anyone know Latin for discharge? So that was some discharge from the pin sites. And how do we treat them? In the UK, we take a microbiology swab, which would be almost certainly a complete waste of time because the infections are almost always the normal skin commensals, so stack oils. So you're better off treating them empirically with a course of oral antibiotics. Increase the frequency of cleaning of the pin site, which should be daily anyway. And if it gets really bad, you need to change the site of the pin location, so take it out and put it somewhere else, or consider another treatment modality. Do an operation, say. Prevention is the best thing, and we prevent these by making sure that the pin site is in the right place, that it's looked at daily and cleaned, um, and isn't in for too long. So let's take an example, a femoral fracture. A femoral patient arrives in ED, um, their leg is short, they're in a lot of pain. The first thing we do is put on very basic skin traction and hang some weights over the end of the bed. Very effective first aid. Then you're going to be in bed for a little bit longer. We need to start thinking about balancing this traction to, the, to reduce the fractures. And so the principle of complex balanced traction is you think, need to think about the vectorial forces. So you have lots of um, and beams. I don't know what you call them, but that's what we call the bars that go over the top. Many, many more than we do. And so you could, if you wanted to, set up this type of traction. And in this situation, there's an equal force going this way, an equal force going this way, and so our vectorial force is in this direction, which is directly along the line of the field, which is exactly what you want. And it allows the patient to be much more comfortable with their leg elevated. You also need to think about converting to skeletal traction in this situation. If you are going to treat them for a long time, you get a situation where you can take out the end of the bed and allow the patient to sit up and move the limbs to avoid that joint stiffness disease. If you look at the historical textbooks, there are, they go to great lengths to demonstrate how you can reduce different fracture patterns. So supracondylar fractures of the femur tend to flex. They tend to flex. And so if you change the line of pull or put bolsters underneath on something like this, which is a broad frame, you can even treat the most difficult periarticular fractures by with traction. But in the UK, this is a completely lost art. I think in the UK now, we struggle to find the nurse that can even set up a balanced traction system. Is that there in your, in the big hospital? I work in a little hospital. One of these so, guys work in bigger hospitals. Is it the same? Yeah. Yeah. And so by balanced traction, there are all sorts of complicated arrangements. And of course, because we live in the West, they can monetize it. So the bed on the left will cost fifteen or twenty thousand um, dollars. And bed bits you can take the end away. And this has got all the bits of a balanced traction system. It's got a trapeze so the patient can lift themselves up. He's got a Thomas splint on to, to pull the fracture straight. There's something called a Pearson attach, attachment here which allows him to bend his knee and flex his hip. What else is there? And that's it. And he's on a very fancy mattress that prevents him getting ulcer, uh, decubitus ulcers. <coughs> Um, so other types of traction. Well, in the old days, when the only options were, were uh, plaster, they worked out ways of um, treating every single type of fracture with traction. So on the left-hand side, that's a child being treated with a supracondylar fracture, with something called Dunlop traction. So if you see here, they've got a weight hanging off their arm, off their humerus, and then they've got skin traction uh, with longitudinal force pulling their supracondylar fracture just here straight. The child must have thought he'd woken up in hell when he woke up in general and said it ties to the bed like that. Other sites. Uh, so this is, this is your method of keeping the, um, the pin sites on it, which is very neat. So you can have a supramalleola site for a pin going through the fibula, across the intercostal membrane, and out the tibia at the other side. That's a very safe place for traction. 
when you need to be two or three centimeters above the ankle to make sure that you don't go into the ankle capsule on the medial side. There are, I found pictures on the internet of screws into the electron, uh, screws into the grace transfer for pelvic fractures to pull the, the um, femur out of the pelvis, um, and of course halter tracking uh, for patients with neck injuries. But, uh, yeah. So just as a final thought, you can even reduce intraarticular fractures with traction, as we all know with our uh, distal radial fracture, for example, a distal radial fracture. And that's because of this concept of ligamentous taxis. So around this fracture, the capsule is attached to every single bit of bone all the way around here. So if you pull on the carpus, it'll pull all these bits of bone back into the right place, which is why our wrist fractures reduce so beautifully when we just put gentle and increasing traction on the knee deep. But the exception to that is if you have a die punch fracture. So this patient here has got a, a, a centrally depressed bit in the middle, which hasn't got any soft tissue attachments. So it doesn't matter how hard you pull on this fracture, because this patient, this bit of the, uh, of the joint hasn't got a ligament attached to it, it won't come out to length. And that's called ligament attachments, and that fracture won't reduce. So I first came here in 2013, and your, your main orthopedic ward, this is what it used to look like, which is why it was such a shock, because your new beautiful ward is fantastic. But what's good about this is everything, everything in this picture, there are so many, everything about the traction is good in this picture, isn't it? The patient's end of the beds are elevated on blocks, so that they, the patients have got gravity, providing counter traction. There's a, uh, a chap here lifting himself up, getting himself mobile. It hasn't projected as well as I'd hoped. You can see that the line of pull of traction in every single patient is exactly right, and the knots aren't at the end resting on the pulleys like they were when uh, me and Martin wandered by without doing anything. So, you know, your wards are now fantastic. But I get the impression that there's even less traction here now. <coughs> so things have really changed. So in summary, traction is an invaluable first aid tool. It's useful for intermediate and the total treatment of some patients if they can't have an operation or they don't want an operation. Successful treatment needs um, attention from every single member of the team. So every time you go past the end of the bed, just make sure the weights aren't on the floor. Make sure the end of the bed is lifted. There are no knots and that the patients are comfortable and they're moving around. Encourage them to sit up. Um, in our country, the skills are being lost. It's down to you guys to maintain the standards to avoid the complications. And it is time consuming and difficult for the patients. So, thank you very much, that's all I've got to say. But I've just got one more slide. So, um, can anybody guess what's happened here? This is a CT scan of a foot. Gunshot. Yes, gunshot. So I did a fellowship in North America many, many years ago. And this patient came into ED, and the front of his foot was dusky blue, and there was a hole in the top of his foot, and a hole in the bottom of his foot with bits of shot in it. Because he'd been in his car in Alaska with a shotgun, and his dog, and the shotgun was loaded, the dog trod on the trigger and shot him through the foot. And I put the picture up because isn't it extraordinary that it's a CT scan? So this, when the patient came in, it was obvious that he needed a baloney amputation because the foot was unsalvageable. And we all have our cultural differences about amputation. But in America, they've got the need to do a CT scan before doing the amputation. I mean, imagine the expense and the time it took to do that. But I just love the picture. So, anyway, thank you very much. <coughs>
um, one people or one more superficial to get a better grip in osteoporosis. And I've done that before. But you just need to make sure that your care of the pin sites and your observation of the pin sites is meticulous to make sure that it isn't cutting out. Um, and maybe consider surgery earlier in a patient like that rather than later. <laughs> Yeah, very much. So, you know, the younger bone is good and solid and, and hard, <coughs> and older patients are much more likely to be osteoporotic. But, you know, osteoporosis isn't a contraindication to either traction or surgery. It just makes you need to be more uh, careful about how you think about where you put it, how you apply it, and when you do it. Younger patients are much less good at tolerating traction application under local anaesthetic on the ward. Um, because they feel the pain much more. Uh, whereas older patients tend to, this, this is certainly a UK experience, older patients are much more likely to tolerate having even femoral traction put in on the wall. That actually get an, an old fashioned standard general anaesthetic are the sickest patients because if you have valvular heart disease, um, giving a spinal causes enormous, I'm getting a bit out of my depth here, it causes enormous fluctuations in blood pressure, and so you can kill the patient with a spinal because they can't maintain their um, peripheral vascular resistance, I assume. And so often those sick patients that we operate on have a general anaesthetic, they just make us do it quickly for surgery. Thank you. 